Lori Nesson was a 15-year-old teenager who lived with her mother on the east side of Columbus, Ohio. She was a sophomore at Eastmore High School. On September 27, 1974, Lori left her house to go to a high school football game and then went to a party afterwards. She would never make it home that night. When Lori didn't arrive at home, her mother contacted police. A police search was immediately carried out. Lori was last seen leaving the party and heading home after midnight. The following day, on September 28, 1974, Lori's nude body would be found in a roadside ditch alongside Rose Hill Road in Reynoldsburg, five miles from where she was last seen. Her clothes were found scattered across several miles. Her cause of death was unable to be determined. Police tried everything to find her killer, but with little to no leads, the case soon grew cold. The case would remain cold for 45 years. Then, in August 2019, Lori's family urged the Reynoldsburg police to re-examine the case. The Reynoldsburg police agreed and asked the Franklin County coroner to reevaluate Lori's autopsy. In 2020, a local TV channel called 10TV featured Lori's case and asked anyone with any information to come forward. After seeing the segment on TV, a viewer contacted police and told them that Lori's case had similarities with the death of the viewer's own cousin, Karen Adams. Karen Adams was a 17-year-old girl who went missing in March of 1975, approximately six months after Lori went missing. Her body would be found in a ditch on Wingert Road in Blacklick, Ohio. Karen's case would also go cold. But in 2011, the investigators reopened the case. The investigators sent DNA samples retrieved from Karen's crime scene to the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Soon, DNA matched up to two individuals, 72-year-old Robert Meyer and Charles Weber. Robert Meyer was arrested and questioned. At first, Robert denied any involvement in Karen's murder. However, in 2012, while in prison, he admitted to killing Karen. He told investigators that he would prowl for women, abduct them, sexually assault them, and then kill them. He was sentenced to 15 years to life in May of 2012. After Karen's cousin tipped off police about the possible connection between Karen and Lori's murder, the police were able to link Robert Meyer and Charles Weber to Lori's murder using DNA profiles in March of 2021. Both Robert and Charles, however, were already deceased. They both had extensive criminal histories. Robert was convicted in 1963 and spent 10 years in prison, where he met Charles, who was also serving time. Both would be freed in the early 1970s. The duo would again be arrested and charged for the kidnapping, assault, and attempted murder of two other women in the Northwest Ohio area. In 1977, both were convicted for crimes and imprisoned. Charles died in prison in 1993, while Robert was freed in 2001 and remained free until 2011, when he was finally charged in prison for Karen Adams' murder. He died in prison a few years later. The case was finally solved after 46 years. While both perpetrators have now been positively and conclusively identified, their deaths prior to the complete convictions for the totality of their crimes leave a hole in the hearts of family and friends of those victimized. On December 20th, 1976, a dismembered body of a female was found in Carbon County, Pennsylvania, near Interstate 80 by the bank of Lehigh River. The woman had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. In what some detectives called overkill, after her death, the victim was then shot in the neck. During the autopsy, it was determined that the victim was in fact nine months pregnant and her nearly full-term unborn child had also died during the attack. The victim's body had been dismembered with a serrated blade. Her ears, nose, and breasts were severed and have never been recovered. Her other severed body parts were found inside three suitcases, along with the fetus that had been removed before the dismemberment. Two of the suitcases were striped with red, blue, and white, while the other was tan with a plaid design. The suitcase handles had been removed and appeared to have been spray-painted black at some point. One suitcase contained her torso, the second contained her arms and legs, and the third contained her head and fetus. 
The police believe that the suitcases were thrown out of a moving vehicle into the Lehigh River below. The killer had probably hoped the suitcases would sink in the water, however, one of the suitcases ended up on the riverbank. A 14-year-old boy found the suitcase with the remains in it while playing near the river's edge. Police soon found the other two suitcases in the woods, about 20 feet away from the riverbank. The police took the body to Naddenhuden Hospital for examination. On December 23, 1976, after three hours of examination, it was determined that the victim had been a white female in her late teenage years, or possibly early 20s. She was pregnant with a daughter who seemed to have been due any day prior to her untimely death. The victim's identity was unable to be determined and she was named Beth Doe by police. The victim's fingerprints were taken and were submitted to the FBI, however, it did not match anyone in the national database. Her teeth were examined and recorded in dental records. A composite sketch of the victim was made and was distributed throughout the country, however, no credible leads could be found. She was buried in 1983 under the name Beth Doe. In 2007, her body was exhumed for further forensic analysis and a new facial reconstruction was also made. However, police were unable to match it to any missing person. In November of 2020, Beth Doe's DNA was entered into a public database of genetic genealogy. Soon, familial DNA eventually led investigators to the victim's nephew, Luis Colon Jr. Luis put police in touch with other family members including the victim's brother. On March 31st, 2021, Beth Doe was finally identified as Evan Colon. In 1976, Evelyn was living with her then-boyfriend, 19-year-old Luis Sierra. Her family said in 1976, when Evelyn was eight or nine months pregnant with Luis's baby, they lost all contact with her. They said that in December of 1976, they had visited Evelyn's apartment in Jersey City, New Jersey, where she stayed with Luis. But after reaching the apartment, they found it abandoned, and they soon received a letter stating that the couple had moved to Connecticut and that Evelyn had delivered her daughter and was happy. The letter said that she would contact them if she needed anything. The family, thinking Evelyn had decided to live her own life, did not file a missing persons report. The family told investigators that Luis was abusive and jealous towards Evelyn, and often kept her locked inside the apartment. Evelyn even told her mother that she feared Luis, and that if anything happened to her, then Luis was likely involved. After decades of uncertainty on both the part of investigators and family alike, Evelyn's body received an official marker with her true name. Evelyn's identification brought to light the identity of her baby, who never got a chance to live but was nevertheless already named and loved. The name her mother had chosen for her in happier days was Emily Grace, and her identification was finally able to be added to the gravesite, next to the name of the only adult that she ever knew, her first and only home, her mother. Luis was arrested and charged with murder. At the time of his arrest, he was 63 years old and residing in Ozone Park, New York. He is being held without bail and is awaiting extradition to Pennsylvania for Evelyn's murder. No other details regarding his arrest have been made public. In November of 1980, an archaeologist digging in a remote part of the Mojave Desert found the bodies of two victims, a male and a female. Both had been killed and buried in a shallow grave a few miles east of Ludlow, California. They were found nude and had no identification on them. An autopsy revealed that they had died from a combination of gunshot wounds and blunt force trauma. The coroner determined the victims had been killed and buried six to eight months before they were found. Both were believed to be in their 20s when they died. The police utilized all their resources to try and identify the victims for years, but to no avail. Meanwhile, investigators were able to find a potential suspect in the case. Howard Neal was a Ludlow resident and had left the town soon after the murders. He reportedly moved to Mississippi, where he was charged for murdering his brother, his 13-year-old niece, and his niece's 12-year-old friend in 1981. 
In February of 1982, Howard was convicted and sentenced to death for the murders. However, eight years later, his sentence was overturned and changed to a triple life sentence. After an IQ test conducted on Howard showed that he had a low enough IQ to indicate that he was borderline mentally disabled. The police tried to interview Howard multiple times throughout the years, but Howard's attorney refused all requests for interviews. But, privately, his attorney did inform the police that they did not have to look any further for a suspect in the Ludlow murders. In 2017, the investigators were finally able to interview Howard. During his interview, he confessed to the Ludlow murders. He told investigators that the two victims were hitchhiking on Highway 66 and he had picked them up. He then took them to his house where he tried to sleep with the female victim. This resulted in an argument between Howard and the male victim. Howard then shot and killed the male. He then sexually assaulted the female and killed her as well. He then buried their bodies in a shallow grave in an isolated area off of Highway 66. Howard, however, did not know much about the victims. He did mention that the female may have been from Arkansas and may have had a daughter that she had left behind to travel across the country. He could not provide any information about the male other than he looked like a quote, hippie. In 2018, Christine Marie Sally, who lived in Virginia, hired a private investigator to find her biological parents. The private investigator submitted her DNA to the GED Match database. In December of 2020, her DNA finally matched with the DNA of the female Ludlow victim, which had been submitted by the police a few years prior. The match indicated that the victim was most likely the mother of Christine Marie Sally. Christine told the investigators that the adoption papers obtained by the private investigators had her biological mother's name, Pamela Diane Duffy. The investigators then submitted another sample of Christine's DNA, along with the female victim's DNA, to the California Department of Justice, who confirmed that the female victim was indeed Christine's mother. The female victim was finally identified as Pamela Diane Duffy. Christine told investigators that she learned before that her mother had gone missing. She recalls that her mother had been associated with a man known as Diggers Lane. She also told the investigators that the man had served time in a Virginia prison. Her mother had plans to travel across the country with him after he was released from prison in 1979. However, after going through the database, the police were unable to find a man by the name of Diggers Lane. With the help of Virginia State Police, they were able to narrow down the list to one person, who matched the criteria. The person's name was William Everett Lane, but there was no information that he went by the name Digger. His arrest records included his home address, which led police to several of his family members. William's mother submitted a DNA sample, and in April of 2021, the male victim was finally confirmed to be William Everett Lane. The victims were finally given their rightful names, and the case was solved after 42 years. Jean Tuggy was a 60-year-old woman who lived alone in a small house on Erion Street in Pine Grove Mills. Friends and family described her as friendly, caring, and kind-hearted. She was in charge of the library at the State College Alliance Church and worked two jobs, one as a longtime bus driver and another at a grocery store called Wegmans. On January 21, 2016, Jean failed to show up at a friend's house. Her friends became worried as this was out of the ordinary for her. Her friends then decided to check up on her and visited her house. They found her door to be locked and her blue Honda Civic in the driveway. They soon found a basement door which was left unlocked. They went inside and found Jean lying dead in a pool of blood. They immediately notified police. Jean's body was lying on the living room floor. Her sweatshirt was pulled up to reveal her stomach, and her sweatpants were pulled partially down. An autopsy was performed, and it was revealed that Jean had been shot twice. One bullet was found in the left side of her face, near her neck, which cut through her spinal cord and embedded into her spine, while the second bullet that was found was in her hip. A ballistics expert confirmed the bullets belonged to a 9mm pistol. During their investigation, Two co-workers told detectives that Jean had mentioned a male co-worker from Wegmans with whom she had developed a friendship, and that he had become romantically interested in her. However, the police were unable to identify this male co-worker. 
Then, in 2019, Peter Corre, who was a friend of Jean's, told investigators that Jean had once told him about a male co-worker of hers that had rubbed her back while visiting her at her home. Peter said the man was named Chris and had a Polish-sounding last name that ended in Ski. The co-worker was in his late 20s or early 30s and attended the local Lutheran church. The investigators were soon able to identify the male co-worker as 34-year-old Christopher Kowalski through information from a church he attended, internet searches, and address records. Christopher had worked at Wegmans from November of 2007 to October of 2015. The police then went through Jean's computer hard drive and found Facebook chat logs between Jean and Christopher, in which they discussed their friendship and their mutual experience of loneliness. In 2019, another friend of Jean's told investigators that she recalled a conversation with Jean where Jean told her that she believed Christopher wanted a more romantic relationship than she did and that he got upset whenever she refused his sexual advances. Her friend said that Jean was planning to invite Christopher over to speak with him about their relationship remaining platonic. The police did a firearm check on Christopher in May of 2019 and found that Christopher had purchased six 9mm handguns. One of the six handguns, a Walther CCP, was purchased one month prior to Jean's death and then sold off about six months after her murder. The investigators tracked down the pistol to its current owner, who had bought the pistol from a Pennsylvania sporting goods store about 10 months after Jean was murdered. The gun was owned by only two people since it had been made. The owners allowed the investigators to take the gun for testing. A forensic test was done on the gun and the bullets recovered from the crime scene. Although the results were inconclusive, the test bullets and the bullets recovered from the crime scene had similarities and matched the bullets in all characteristics. An expert stated that the minor differences in the bullets could have been caused by someone cleaning the barrel of the pistol with an abrasive tool. Police found and interviewed Christopher at his home in South Carolina. He initially claimed he and Jean were just friends and nothing else. However, he later said that he and Jean were romantically involved. He told investigators that on the day Jean was murdered, he went to her apartment to watch movies together. He claimed that as he was taking off his coat to hang it on her coat rack, his gun from his coat pocket fell to the floor and discharged. The bullet hit Jean in the hip. He then allegedly picked up the gun and it was jammed when he tried to clear it, so it fired again and struck Jean in the neck. He stated that blood was everywhere and claimed he did not try to save her as he knew it was too late. After the police told him that his story did not make any sense, Christopher admitted to shooting and killing her intentionally. He allegedly said, quote, The truth is, I killed her. I killed her because I was depressed, down, and hopeless. I was having a midlife crisis. He said that he first shot Jean in the hip and she fell over the couch. The gun jammed, but he was able to clear it and shot her again in the neck. He also turned off her oxygen to make sure she was really dead. He said that he pulled her pants down and had planned to take pictures of her undressed, but did not as he was afraid his clothes might get blood on them. He then picked up the shell casings, locked the front door, left the house from the basement door, and disposed of the casings outside of a restaurant. He told investigators that he had planned to kill Jean before her murder and that he chose to kill her because she was an easy target. He moved to South Carolina in 2016. Christopher was arrested and charged with Jean's murder. He will be extradited to Pennsylvania to be prosecuted. Felicia Howard was a 21-year-old woman who lived with her four-year-old daughter, Denisha, in their second-floor apartment at 3804 Washington Street in Gary, Indiana. Felicia and her daughter, Denisha, had recently moved from Indianapolis to Gary in January of 1992. They stayed with Felicia's father for a few months, but on June 7th, she decided to move away from her father's house and get her own place on Washington Street. However, her landlord would send her an eviction notice on July 10th, reportedly due to her lifestyle. On July 11th of 1992, Felicia picked up Denisha from her regular weekend stay at Felicia's father's house. This was the last time her father saw either of them alive. On July 15th of 1992, five days after sending the eviction notice, her landlord brought prospective tenants to show the apartment. 
When he opened the door of the apartment, he found Felicia and Denisha's body. He immediately called the police. Both mother and daughter had been shot to death. Felicia had been shot in the chest. She had been found lying nude in her bed and appeared to be reaching for Denisha, who had been shot in the head. The investigators were able to collect DNA of an unknown male source from the crime scene. The murders shocked the residents in and around Gary. Several locals raised money to set up a reward for any information regarding the murders. Neighbors would later report hearing Felicia screaming, quote, Please don't shoot me in front of my daughter. They also reported to have heard a child standing on the balcony screaming, quote, Help, help, and, quote, Stop, stop, for about half an hour. However, no one came to help. No neighbor mentions why police were not called, despite obvious pleas from the now deceased victims. With no leads and no suspects, the case would soon go cold. In 2019, the FBI's Gang Response Investigative Team, or GRIT, reopened the case and began investigating. With the help of DNA technology and re-interviewing witnesses, they finally were able to find a suspect. In September of 2020, 56-year-old Victor Lofton was questioned by detectives and asked to give a DNA sample in Tennessee. During their questioning, investigators showed Victor a photo of Felicia and Denisha, and he was asked if he knew them. He reportedly bit his lip and admitted that while he did live with a relative in Gary in the 1980s, he did not know Felicia or Denisha. Victor's relative confirmed that Victor had lived with him for a couple of months in 1992. He also told investigators that Victor owned a Browning 38 caliber handgun. The spent shell casing found at the crime scene had markings consistent with the 38 caliber handgun. The U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives was able to recover the handgun owned by Victor, and a forensic analysis was conducted. However, the analysis could not identify nor exclude the bullet to have been fired from the handgun. Investigators analyzed the unknown male DNA found at the scene. The analysis showed that the unknown male's DNA matched that of Victor. Its DNA profile was one trillion times more likely to originate from Victor than from any other male. On February 5th, 2021, Victor Lofton was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. He has been extradited to Lake County and is awaiting trial. In the late night hours of June 26, 1984, Fort Myers police responded to a complaint of gunshots heard near Palm Avenue and Lincoln Boulevard. Lying on the ground at the side of the road at 2831 Lincoln Boulevard was Claritha Coco Gibbs, who was bleeding profusely from a single gunshot wound to the abdomen. Coco was rushed to the hospital, but she succumbed to her injuries and was declared dead by emergency physicians. Prior to that fateful night, Coco had lived close by, on Mango Street. Born in Tampa, Florida, Coco moved to Fort Myers from Houston, Texas in 1979. At only 31 years old, Coco had had a rough life. She was a street worker and therefore vulnerable to the various dangers of such an illegal late night trade with anonymous customers. Coco was last seen entering a vehicle, possibly a pickup truck, with two different toned paint colors. Witnesses say that it was only moments after she entered the vehicle that they heard a gunshot and the car peeled out of the area, leaving a bleeding woman on the sidewalk. The driver of the vehicle was described as a white male in his 30s with light brown or dark blonde hair. He was described as having a thin build and was approximately 5'10 with a pale complexion although the height was hard to approximate as he was seated inside a vehicle. Police said they recovered a rag with the suspect's DNA, but DNA testing was not common or very advanced at that time. After a full DNA profile of the suspect had been created from the unknown type of DNA left in the rag, it was then entered into CODIS, the FBI's national DNA database, but it did not provide a hit to any known samples. In March of 2019, Fort Myers Police Department's cold case unit investigators submitted the DNA evidence to Parabon Snapshot in hopes that the advances made using genealogy research in the last few decades could pinpoint a suspect who was most likely still at large. 
On July 22, 2020, Parabon Labs completed a report on the genealogy, which indicated that the DNA profile was linked through databases to an individual identified as James Glenn Drennan, 65, of Okeechobee. Investigators began to look into the current life and past history of Drennan and tried to get details on his former link to the Fort Myers area. They were one step closer to answers when they found that he lived in Lee County in 1984, putting him geographically in relatively close proximity to the area that Coco was found. Jenin, who was a local mechanic, acknowledged that Coco was a prostitute and that he had invited her into his truck to engage in her paid services. When police arrived at his house, Drennan admitted to the physical connection, but said that Coco had actually pulled the gun on him in order to take his money after he picked her up for a rendezvous. He claimed that they fought over the weapon and that Gibbs was shot accidentally. Drennan fled the scene and said that he subsequently threw the murder weapon out the window of his truck. In addition to the murder of Coco in the 80s, there were a known total of 16 other women who worked in the same trade as Coco that were killed over a 20-year period in the Fort Myers area alone. While there is no concrete evidence that links Drennan to these crimes, he died of unknown causes at his residence in Okinjobi before police could continue to question him or arrest him for Coco's death. While no details were released, it is suspected he took his own life after realizing his past crimes were coming back to haunt him. Twenty-one-year-old Annette Schnee and twenty-nine-year-old Barbara Bobby Joe Oberholzer were just starting their lives in a most adventurous way when it was tragically cut short for the both of them. On January 29th, 1982, 29-year-old Bobby Jo was hitchhiking from her home in Alma, Colorado, to her job in the nearby town of Breckenridge. Unlike today, in that part of the country in the early 80s, hitchhiking was not seen as a dangerous act, and both drivers and would-be passengers were far more comfortable with the idea of riding with a stranger than one would be in today's millennium. At 6.20 p.m., Bobby made a call to her husband, Jeff Oberholzer, to tell him that she was going out for cocktails with friends at a local bar and not to worry because she would find her own ride home. But Bobby never made it home that night. When her husband Jeff questioned Bobby's friends, they were surprised that she never returned home as she had left the pub alone at 7.50 p.m. The next day, January 7th, Bobby's husband received a call from a rancher who had found Bobby's driver's license on the ground of his property. On his way to investigate to get more information on his wife's whereabouts, Jeff was shocked to see his missing wife's backpack laying in a field alongside her gloves, which, upon further examination, had blood on them. There were also some bloody tissues next to the bag. DNA testing was so infantile in 1982 that the only information gleaned from the evidence left behind was the blood type, which matched that of Bobby, but little else was known. That afternoon, around 3 p.m., Bobby's body was discovered, deceased, at the summit of a lookout point called Hosier Pass, located about 10 miles south of Breckenridge. She was found about 20 feet off the highway and was at the bottom of a snow embankment. The 29-year-old had been shot twice in the chest. She had plastic zip ties around one of her wrists, and the other was free. Also found on the scene was an orange sock that investigators did not think belonged to the victim. Evidence shows, police said, that Bobby attempted to escape the vehicle and put up a fight before being shot and succumbing to her injuries. Her self-defense keyring, a tool with a metal hook on it made for her by her husband, was found in the parking lot at the summit which was approximately 300 feet from where her body was found, suggesting that she may have escaped and then was again confronted by the assailant. The same day that Bobby was reported missing, Annette Schnee, a 21-year-old resident of the nearby town of Frisco was also reported missing. The young woman was last seen inside a pharmacy in Breckenridge at 4.45, the evening of the 6th. She was seen speaking to a dark-haired woman who police requested come forward but never did. Annette was scheduled that night to be at work by 8 p.m. at the Flipside Bar in Breckenridge and was known to hitchhike to get to her job. Though she went missing on the same day as Bobby, family and friends had to wait much longer for answers, and some still held out hope that she would be found alive. 
The death of one woman and another missing, presumed dead, alarmed those who resided nearby. The randomness of the two seemingly unconnected girls unnerved the public, and some spoke of a possible serial killer descending upon the area. Almost six months after she was first reported missing, on July 3rd, Annette's body was found in the shallow waters of a creek located near a remote side road in Rural Park County, about 20 miles south of Breckenridge. The snow and cold had preserved the body, and investigators were able to ascertain many details regarding her death. Much like Bobby, Annette had been shot to death, with the bullet going through her chest and exiting with no leftover fragments. Police estimated that it was the bullet hole left by a 38 or 357, possibly a 9mm handgun. They believed she was killed where she was left. What conclusively linked the crimes of both women was the presence of a second orange sock. While an orange sock had been found at the crime scene of Bobby's death, police never believed the sock actually belonged to her, and it was to their surprise that they saw Annette was in fact wearing the other sock an orange sock similar to the one that was found near the scene of Bobby's murder. It became apparent that this was indeed a match to the orange sock from Bobby's case. On Annette's other foot was a striped sock, and the matching pair to that sock was stuffed in Annette's jacket hood. Police theorized that the killer probably first picked up Annette, who had been hitchhiking, and murdered her prior to picking up Bobby, also while hitchhiking, a few hours later and murdering her as well. Investigators wondered if one of Annette's orange socks, already separated from their owners in a violent and brutal act, possibly fell out of the killer's vehicle and landed erroneously at the scene that Jeff would soon come upon while looking for his wife, Bobby. This is the reason that the crime was dubbed the Orange Sock Murders in the media, not to be confused with the murder of Deborah Louise Jackson, who, before the body was identified, was informally known as Orange Socks. Later, Annette's backpack would be discovered in another location off of Route 285. Police were puzzled to find that her bag contained a picture of a man who was unrecognizable to friends or family of Annette. The photo was never identified by police. Even stranger, Annette's wallet also had Bobby's husband, Jeff Oberholzer's, business card in it. When questioned by authorities, Jeff was shocked to recall that, upon thinking deeply about it, he had actually previously picked up the 21-year-old Annette back when she had been hitchhiking months prior to the day of her murder. He recalled that he'd given Annette his business card, but starkly swore that he had never seen her again. Because of this strange and seemingly unlikely coincidence, Bobby's husband Jeff was looked at as the prime suspect for both murders. While Jeff did have an alibi for that night, he was in Alma hosting a friend it wasn't until December of 1990 that that friend who had visited that night was finally tracked down and questioned by police in order to verify Jeff's alibi. Shortly thereafter, as DNA profiling became more accurate and detailed, DNA testing was performed on the blood from Bobby's glove, and it was found that it was male, not female blood, and therefore they concluded that the blood was left presumably when Bobby fought back and likely punched her attacker in the nose, which perhaps explained the bloody tissues as well. The lab results showed that the blood belonged to a male donor, but not to Jeff. The new DNA results finally exonerated Jeff, the long-grieving husband falsely accused due to a shocking coincidence, but police were then faced with a shortening list of other possible suspects. At one point, they suspected self-proclaimed serial killer Thomas Luther, who had supposedly bragged of taking the lives of two women in the Breckenridge area. But when police questioned him in prison, he ominously said, They aren't my girls. Metro Denver Crime Stoppers helped fund the use of genetic genealogy in this particular case. They funded it in hopes that the relatively new technology would help bring closure as it had done for at least five local cases in the past two years. This case would be no different, as new capabilities and databases enabled detectives to finally find a match to the DNA left long ago at the scene of the crime. Testing and analysis indicated a possible link to 70-year-old Alan Lee Phillips, a semi-retired mechanic and resident of Clear Creek County. Law enforcement spent over six weeks investigating and conducting surveillance before finally arresting the now elderly and disheveled man on February 24th without a struggle 
during a traffic stop made in Clear Creek County. Phillips was remanded to the Park County Jail without bail on charges of kidnapping, assault with a deadly weapon, and murder after deliberation. Phillips had lived in Colorado continuously since the killings and was never considered a suspect previously. His last court date was scheduled for March 8, 2021, but so far no details have come out in the media and it may have been postponed. Much of this work can be attributed to Denver Police Detective Charlie McCormick, who has been working on this case since 1989 and was skeptical that closure would ever come. In the chaos of news, friends and family still strive to remember the people lost. Quote, All I know was, she loved people, a friend said of Annette, who is now forever 21 years old. She was a fun-loving person to be around. She was a wonderful person. That's all I can say, because she didn't have a chance to do anything else. It has been more than 40 years since Barbara Mae Tucker was bludgeoned to death on January 15, 1980. Described by one family member as a goofball, she stood out due to her model-esque height at almost 6 feet tall. She had light brown hair and deep brown eyes. The youngest of seven children, she was always looked after and taken care of at home. But the safety net of family would be considerably weakened when, in pursuit of independence and success, she enrolled in night classes at her local community college. It was while on her way to one of these classes at Mount Hood Community College, which is nestled next to the woods in picturesque Grisham, Oregon, that Barbara was brutally and publicly assaulted. On her walk to class, she was intercepted and attacked. Somehow, after being assaulted, she managed to escape and run through the woods to a nearby road. The darkness of the winter night partially hid Barbara's bloodied face as she attempted to flag down drivers on Northeast Kane Drive. But, indifferent to the plight of the 19-year-old desperately asking for help, the drivers continued on their way. Those who were later tracked down as witnesses recall seeing cars having to suddenly swerve to avoid the bloodied girl who, in her panic and trauma, had veered into the street on Northeast Kane Drive. One witness recalls that they thought they were about to witness the teen being killed right in front of their eyes when a passing car almost struck her. Even though curious onlookers recall noticing what looked like caked on dirt mixed with what seemed like blood smeared all over her body, not one person stopped to help. People continued to stand idly by even as a man roughly grabbed the young woman and yanked her back into the woods. A few of those interviewed justified their inaction by saying that they believed it to be some alcohol-fueled college dare or a game. But as soon as the all-seeing sun began to slowly draw the curtains from the darkness of the college campus, the brutal truth became apparent to all in the vicinity. The exact timeline of Barbara's brutal attack, escape, subsequent recapture, and murder is unknown, as only two people were privy to the exact timeline of those events, the attacker and his victim. One would not live to tell the tale. The other would disappear for what many thought would be forever. But one thing was certain, Barbara could have been helped by many passing by that night, and yet all chose to do nothing. Ruminating on the preventability of the whole situation, Barbara's mother, Louise Tucker, told the press, quote, It is unreal that people care so little about another human being. Barbara's body, beaten, bruised, and left for dead in the bushes of her college campus was discovered by a fellow student. Evidence was taken from the scene and stored securely for over four decades. In those ensuing four decades, the world of DNA technology changed tremendously, and thanks to the hard work and dedication of genetic genealogist C.C. Moore, founder of DNA Detectives based out of Virginia, police were finally able to name a suspect in Barbara's killing. Robert Plimpton, age 58, was living in Troutdale, Oregon at the time of his arrest. He was remanded into custody by the Grisham Police Department on June 8, 2021. 
Plimpton, who was only 16 years old when Barbara was killed, had no ties to the victim that investigators know of at the time. There's been no motive released. Plimpton had been previously arrested in 1997 under suspicion of sexual assault. In that 1997 case, police believed that Plimpton drove the female victim to a secluded area in order to brutally attack her. However, the case was eventually dismissed due to lack of substantiating evidence. Physical evidence from the 1980 crime scene was maintained and preserved for future testing. And recently, a newly inputted DNA code match led investigators to Plimpton. This revelation was made possible due to the massive amounts of DNA data taken from Ancestry sites such as Ancestry.com or 23andMe. Both of Barbara's parents have since passed prior to this recent development, but in their interviews they recall their last memory of their 19-year-old daughter. She called them on her way to class and told them that if she got out early she might stop to get ice cream. She never made it to class, and she never got that ice cream. Plimpton, now married and a father of two children, has been charged for the rape and murder of 19-year-old Barbara. Though Plimpton was 16 years old at the time, he will be tried as an adult. The now 58-year-old is currently incarcerated in Multnomah County Jail, awaiting trial. Janet Stalkup was a 19-year-old nursing student living in Southern California in a city called Garden Grove. On December 19, 1976, Janet left her home to attend a friend's party in nearby Santa Ana. She would never make it to that party. She was reported missing. Police launched a search for her, but it took eight days for her body to eventually be found. Her body was found in the front seat of her own car about two and a half miles from her apartment. An autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and the cause of death was strangulation. Investigators believed that Janet was likely abducted as she was getting into her car. The investigators worked tirelessly but could not find any leads or potential suspects and therefore the case went cold. In 2002, the Orange County Crime Lab was finally able to isolate a single male sequence of DNA from the swabs collected at the crime scene. This DNA profile was entered into the CODIS database, but unfortunately, it did not produce a match. Then, in 2020, Garden Grove Police asked the Orange County District Attorney's Office to use genetic genealogy to find a potential suspect. Using this technique, DNA samples submitted by relatives of a possible suspect can be matched to samples taken from the crime scene. By using familial DNA tracking, this technique can link a person, even if their DNA has not actually been submitted in the database, simply by that of a cousin or an aunt, however far removed. Utilizing this procedure, on July 14, 2021, investigators were finally able to link one Terry Dean Hawkins to the crime scene. While Terry Dean Hawkins was determined to be responsible for Janet Stalkup's sexual assault and murder, he could not be charged as he died in prison in 1977, just one year after his crime. His body was buried in the same cemetery where Janet is currently buried. Terry worked as a mechanic and lived in Garden Grove. He had an extensive criminal record, which included drug and weapons-related crimes. Convicted of a DUI and of indecent exposure, he was also charged with the 1975 killing of a 30-year-old woman in Laguna Hills, but he was never convicted for it and the case was later dismissed. On July 4th, 1977, he was arrested in Newport Beach on suspicion of disorderly conduct and drug-related offenses. He died of an overdose in the Orange County Jail the following day. Janet's family does not believe Janet knew Terry. And while the killer, just like his victim, has been long gone from this earth, Janet's family may find some peace in the answers that DNA technology have brought as after 44 years, the case was finally solved. Gail Barris was a 30-year-old single mother working as a nursing assistant in Battle Creek, Michigan. 
Her three children were only 10, 12, and 13 years old when they lost their mother and sole caretaker. Gail worked tirelessly and without complaint to support her family, but when her job as a nursing assistant wasn't enough to make ends meet, she started working at two local bars, the Beer Keg in Battle Creek and the Redwood Inn in Augusta. On October 8, 1988, Gail went to work, but she failed to return home. She was reported missing by her family when she failed to contact her children. The police launched an extensive search for her, while the family distributed missing person flyers throughout the city, but to no avail. Witnesses reported seeing her leave Speed's Coffee Shop, located at 1425 West Michigan Avenue, around 3 or 4 a.m. Witnesses recall seeing her leaving with a dark-haired man, who they remember as having a mustache and a light beard. The man was believed to be between the ages of 38 to 40. Police found Gail's car parked in front of the coffee shop. Sixteen days after she went missing, her partially decomposed body was found by hunters on River Road in Emmett Township on October 25, 1988, just five miles from her home. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. During their investigation, police initially suspected two friends to be involved in her murder. The first was Roger Plato, who had recently moved to Battle Creek, Michigan from Houston, Texas, after being released from prison earlier that year for robbery. A few days prior to Gail's body being found, police had questioned Roger in connection with another sexual assault. However, during his questioning, Roger attempted to flee. In the ensuing chase, Detective Al Toff shot and killed him. A blood sample was taken from Roger posthumously, and he was subsequently cremated. Even though Roger was killed before Gail's body was found, he was later believed to be involved in her murder. A sample was taken from Roger posthumously and was submitted for DNA testing. However, back then, as the DNA was still in its infancy, the laboratory could not detect or link him to Gail's murder, and he was formally excluded as a suspect. The second person that the police looked at was Richard Compton. Richard was a friend and roommate of Roger. He was questioned by the police, but denied any involvement in Gail's murder. With no suspects and no leads, the case went cold. And it remained that way for 30 years, until Gail's son, James Barris, contacted the police to inquire about his mother's case. The officer assigned to the case, Detective Scott Marshall, then reopened the investigation. Detective Marshall read the case files and began to reinvestigate Roger and Richard as potential suspects. Witnesses also reported having seen a man fitting Richard's description sitting with Gail at the coffee shop on the day she disappeared. A motorist also reported seeing a woman arguing with a man while another man stood by at the spot where Gail's body was found. The police believe the two men were Richard and Roger. Richard died homeless in 2009 from sepsis and cirrhosis of the liver. His body was exhumed in 2019, but a DNA sample taken from him did not match the DNA collected at the crime scene. Detective Marshall then tried to get DNA from Roger, but that proved to be challenging as well, as Roger's body had been cremated. Then, in 2020, an officer at the Calhoun County Sheriff's Office was conducting a routine audit of an evidence storage facility when he located a vial of the blood taken from Roger after he was shot and killed by police for attempting to flee a questioning session. The officer turned over the sample to Michigan's State Police Crime Lab, a DNA test matched Roger's DNA sample to the sample collected from Gail's crime scene. While the police were not able to link Richard's DNA to the crime scene, they did believe he witnessed Gail's sexual assault and murder. While both criminals have now gone on to face their final judgment, Gail's family may find peace in the answers they received due to this technology, as the case was finally closed after 32 years. Stephanie Isaacson was a 14-year-old teenager living with her parents in Las Vegas, Nevada. Stephanie was a freshman at El Dorado High School. 
On the morning of June 1st, 1989, Stephanie left her home near Nellis Boulevard and Stewart Avenue at around 6.30 a.m. to walk to her school. She had walked the route to her school a number of times and would usually take a shortcut through a vacant desert lot at Stewart Avenue and Lynn Lane in order to get to her school faster. She would never make it to her school that day. That afternoon, when she did not return to her home, her father became worried and went out to look for her. He visited her school and found out that Stephanie had never arrived that day. Her father immediately reported her missing. The police launched an extensive search for her. They canvassed her usual route that she took to her school. Soon, they discovered her books and belongings scattered in the vacant desert lot. Next to the belongings, they found her body. A coroner determined that she had been sexually assaulted, beaten, and strangled to death. Investigators searched every possible lead and investigated a number of people, but to no avail. The case would soon grow cold. DNA found at the crime scene was entered into the CODIS database in 2007, but no matches could be found. Then, in January of 2021, with the generous donation of $5,000 from a local resident named Justin Wu, founder of the nonprofit organization Vegas Helps, the investigators were able to send the DNA found at the crime scene out for testing to Othram Labs in order to find any new leads. Authram Labs was able to use genome sequencing in order to build a genetic profile of the killer from the remaining DNA evidence of just 15 human cells. Usually, 100 to 750 nanograms of DNA is used to create a DNA profile, but in this case, only 0.12 nanograms, or 15 human cells, were available for testing. This data set a new lower limit on the quantity required to build a successful DNA profile. With the help of the DNA profile, police were able to name Darren Roy Marchand as the killer. Darren had been previously arrested for the murder of another woman named Nanette Vanderberg in 1986, three years before Stephanie's murder. However, the 1986 case was dismissed due to lack of evidence. Darren's DNA from Nanette's crime scene was matched to the DNA found at Stephanie's crime scene and conclusively linked. However, investigators could not charge Darren for Stephanie or Nanette's murder as he committed suicide in 1995. Though no trial could be had, the case was finally solved after 32 years. Michelle Wyatt was a 20-year-old student who lived in San Diego with her roommate. She'd graduated from Patrick Henry High School and was attending Grossmont College in 1980. She worked as a cashier at Mission Hills Safeway. Her parents described her as an independent go-getter. On October 9, 1980, Michelle's roommate entered her condo complex at 10586 Kerrigan Court in Santee to find Michelle lying in her living room floor, dead. She immediately contacted police. An autopsy revealed that Michelle had been raped. She had also been strangled to death with a telephone cord. The contents of her purse were scattered around, but nothing seemed to have been taken, and police ruled out robbery as a motive. In the hours before Michelle's murder, her boyfriend had left her apartment in the early morning around 1am and locked the door behind him. Sometime later, neighbors heard screams coming from Michelle's apartment, but nobody called 911. Over the years, investigators would search every possible lead but to no avail. 16 years later, about 90 potential suspects were screened and asked to provide DNA samples to compare against the DNA found at the crime scene, but nothing turned up. Then, in June of 2000, with the advancement in DNA technology, evidence collected from the crime scene was sent in for re-examination. Soon, testing revealed that there were two separate DNA profiles at the crime scene. One of the DNA profiles belonged to Michelle's boyfriend, but the other was from an unknown male suspect. Michelle's boyfriend has been eliminated as a suspect. The unknown male suspect's DNA was entered into the combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS, but no matches turned up. 
In March of 2020, investigators ran the DNA through familial DNA search, but again did not find any matches. Then, in September 2020, San Diego County Sheriff Homicide Unit's cold case team used investigative genetic genealogy to find a lead. After nine months of investigation with the help of the FBI and other law enforcement agencies, detectives identified John Patrick Hogan as a potential suspect. John had moved to Santee in the 1970s and was 18 years old at the time of Michelle's murder. He studied at Sanitan High School and lived about a mile away from Michelle. He had friends who lived in the same apartment complex as Michelle, and he was known to visit that complex frequently. John joined the Air Force in 1979 and was stationed in Mexico for a brief period. During his lifetime, he moved around and traveled from California to Arizona and Idaho. Unfortunately, John could not be charged as he died of a drug overdose in 2004 at the age of 42. John is not considered a suspect in any other case so far, but investigators have shared their familial DNA findings with the police in the places that John has lived over the years in hopes that they may solve other cold cases. Leslie McRae was a 17-year-old student living in an apartment with her boyfriend on St. John's Avenue in Jacksonville, Florida. Leslie was studying at the University of North Florida and dreamed of becoming a model. On Christmas Eve of 1985, around 3 a.m., Leslie's boyfriend woke up to find a man with short brown hair kneeling by his bed. The man was holding a knife in his hand and tied Leslie's boyfriend's hands and feet using neckties. He then tied Leslie up and took her with him against her will out of the apartment through the back door, leaving Leslie's boyfriend tied up in the bedroom. Her boyfriend eventually freed himself and called police at 6 a.m. Unfortunately, a few hours later, Leslie's nude body would be found by a passerby along Old Middleburg Road near Interstate 295, five miles from her apartment. She had been sexually assaulted, beaten, and stabbed multiple times in her head, chest, and neck. According to the Florida Times Union newspaper, the police found no sign of forced entry or struggle in the apartment. Police were unable to find any clues at the crime scene that could lead to a potential break in the case, and with no leads and no suspects, the case would grow cold. However, over the years, her family did not give up hope on finding justice. In 2019, her family reached out to Project Cold Case and asked the JSO Cold Case Unit to reopen and re-examine the case. In 2020, investigators re-examined the evidence found at the crime scene using updated technology. They found that the suspect's DNA profile matched to an inmate named David Nielsen Austin in the Michigan Corrections Database. The investigators then went to Michigan in April of 2021 to interview and collect more DNA from David to confirm the match. The tests confirmed the match, and in August of 2021, David was charged with first-degree murder, two counts of armed kidnapping, and one count of armed sexual battery in the case of Leslie McRae. David is serving two life sentences for two other sexual assaults from 1988. David was never considered a suspect in this case before, and he had never been interviewed for the crime. He had lived in Jacksonville for only a short period of time, and then moved to Michigan where he committed the two crimes for which he was caught. Now, prosecutors are hoping David will be extradited to Florida soon to stand trial in Leslie's murder. Patricia Kalitsky and Lloyd Dwayne Bogle were a teenage couple who lived in Great Falls, Montana. In 1956, Patricia was a 16-year-old studying at Great Falls High School, while Lloyd was an 18-year-old airman from Waco, Texas, who had been recently stationed to Malmstrom Air Force Base. The two had met at a party a month prior and had fallen in love with each other almost instantaneously. On January 3, 1956, three young boys were hiking along the Sun River near Wadsworth Park in Great Falls, Montana. 
when they stumbled upon the body of a young man lying next to a car. They immediately notified the police. The young man was soon identified as Lord Dwayne Bogle. He had been shot in the head and his hands were tied behind his back with his own belt. His car ignition was on, with the handbrake pulled up and its headlights still lit. Nothing appeared to be stolen, as all of his belongings and money were still in the car. The police would soon learn that his girlfriend, Patricia, had been with him the previous night, and she also had not returned home. She was reported missing. Fearing the worst, the police launched an extensive search. The next day, on January 4th, 1956, Patricia's body would be found by a county road worker on Vineyard Road, north of Great Falls. Her body was found about eight miles from where her boyfriend Lloyd's body had been found. She had also been shot in the head. It is unclear if the police believed Patricia to have been sexually assaulted. She was found fully clothed. The police did not believe robbery was the motive, as all of her valuables, including her money and an expensive camera, were found inside of Lloyd's car. There were very few to almost no clues for investigators to follow, and while police investigated about 35 people over the years, including the famous gangster James Joseph Whitey Bulger, all of them were eventually cleared and the case grew cold. In 2001, investigators sent a microscopic slide of the vaginal swab taken from Patricia's body to the Montana State Crime Lab for analysis. The lab found sperm cells which did not belong to Lloyd, suggesting that Patricia had been raped. In 2019, the Cascade County investigators sent the DNA sample found on Patricia's body in for additional testing to Bode Technology. When they uploaded the DNA sample to the genealogy database, they found a potential familial connection. Soon, investigators were able to narrow down the family tree to an individual suspect named Kenneth Gold, a man born and raised in Great Falls, Montana. However, as Kenneth died in 2007 and was cremated, the investigators had to reach out to his surviving children to ask for a DNA sample in order to confirm the match. It was found that Kenneth lived with his family just one mile away from where Patricia lived. Kenneth did not have a criminal record and was a horse trainer who was known to ride throughout the area. Kenneth was married at the time and would have been 29 when the couple was murdered. After the murder, Kenneth would sell his property and move to Missouri in 1967. Kenneth was never interviewed in the couple's murder, and investigators could not find any connection between him and his victims. Both Lloyd and Patricia's immediate family were already deceased, but the surviving relatives were relieved to have some closure. The case was solved after 65 years. Virginia Jenny Hannon was regarded highly within the tight-knit community of Pembroke, Massachusetts. She was an adored cook at Bryantville Elementary School. Students and teachers recall how she would lovingly sneak an extra cookie or container of juice to those who needed it. A lover of baking, locals remember fondly how she would make cookies and other confectionery delights for the students and local children. When she wasn't working strenuously for the school, she was known to take in and rehabilitate stray animals. Her gentle and generous nature made the uncovering of her stabbed and beaten body all the more horrific. On February 13, 1984, 59-year-old Jenny, as she was known to those closest to her, was declared deceased in her own home, a victim of a brutal stabbing and strangulation at the hands of a then unknown culprit in what would be the first murder in that sleepy town in over a decade. A widower, Jenny had lost her husband in 1971, 13 years prior to her own premature death. She lived by herself in a quaint cottage on West Street, painted a cheerful yellow, which was located about three miles from the town center. Each year, Jenny was known to make an annual trip to California to visit her aunt. She always spoke well of her aunt and diligently and joyfully made the trip of over 3,000 miles to visit her. Due to her friendliness, some recall that Jenny was known to be a bit too forthcoming with personal details of her family life and general going-on-abouts. 
After her aunt passed away, she inherited $380,000, which is equivalent to over $1 million in 2021, taking into account inflation. Due to this windfall, Jenny was finally able to retire, a welcome respite as she suffered from emphysema and became winded when doing tasks that required even a moderate amount of strenuousness. After receiving her inheritance, Jenny deposited the bulk of the money into the bank, but whether founded or unfounded, whispers that Jenny kept stacks of cash somewhere in her yellow house circulated, and soon the rumor spread like wildfire throughout the small town. On Saturday, February 11th, 1984, one night before her death, Jenny was picked up and brought to the nearby town of Hansen to attend the 5 p.m. mass at St. Joseph's Church with a friend of hers named Dolly, something she regularly did. As they usually did after the service, the two women drove to the city of Halifax and ate at BR's restaurant. After dinner, Dolly drove Jenny home, and they said goodnight to each other at around 7.30 p.m. After dropping her off and watching Jenny walk into her home, nobody, including Dolly, heard from Jenny for the remainder of the weekend. On Monday, February 13th, at around 11 a.m., Jenny's stepfather's housekeeper, who was dropping in to ask for a spare key with which to access the elderly man's apartment to clean, found the 59-year-old in her own bed, with the bedsheet pulled over her face. It was clear upon a visual inspection that her body had undergone a horrendous and brutal beating. Her face bore the marks of repeated battering, and she had been stabbed six times around the torso. Some media reports say she had also been stabbed in one of her eyes. There appeared to be an imprint of a shoe mark on her stomach, which led investigators to believe that she had been stomped on or had been kicked. A pair of pantyhose had been utilized to bind her extremities. Her cause of death appeared to be strangulation. Forced entry was visible to investigators. Both Jenny's window and her front door had been broken in order for the killer to gain entry. Her friend recalls Jenny having $100 in her wallet on the night that she went out to dinner, which was later unaccounted for, leading investigators to wonder if the motive for her murder may have been robbery and that possibly the robber had believed the rumors about the hidden cash from her inheritance from her deceased aunt. While the town was small, no suspects were ever identified in Virginia Hannon's murder. Police canvassed the area and questioned friends, family, and neighbors, but nobody heard anything, and despite the detective's best efforts, the case went cold and stayed that way for nearly 40 years. Then, in 2020, police received a tip saying that a man from Brockton a city in Plymouth County, Massachusetts, named Jesse Isleward, was the culprit in the case which had gone unsolved for so long. The tip was called in one day after Jesse Isleward passed away in the hospital. The person calling the tip into police said that Isleward confessed to the murder while on his deathbed in a hospital at the age of 58, just one year younger than Jenny when she was brutally taken from the world. Isleward was 22 at the time he claims he committed the murder. Isleward, born March 9, 1961, had died February 3, 2020. His obituary described him as intelligent and independent and stated that he liked to help the homeless. Reports claim he worked as a handyman and may have owned his own business at one point. After obtaining a warrant in order to collect a sample that was admissible in a court of law, the police were able to obtain a specimen to test it against the crime scene artifacts, which included DNA collected from the nylon stockings used to bind the victim, the shards of broken glass covered in blood at the crime scene, and the paper towels found on scene that were soaked in blood. The samples pulled were a definitive match to Isleward, and after 37 years, police were able to close the case of Virginia Hannon. Although police finally have the name of Jenny's killer, they do not know the motive for the gruesome killing, besides the possible financial motivations, as so far investigators see no link between Jenny and her admitted killer. On 
On July 11th, 1963, a man fishing in Keene Creek Reservoir near Ashland hooked onto something on his fishing cord. At first, he thought it was a rolled up blanket. However, after reeling in the blanket, he realized that inside the bag was the body of a toddler. He immediately called the police. The boy was fully clothed and was wearing shoes. He was wrapped in a blanket and a handmade patchwork quilt with two iron assayer molds attached to keep it submerged underwater. A coroner determined that the toddler likely suffered from Down syndrome or another genetic abnormality. The boy was estimated to be between one and two years old. Due to the freezing temperatures of the previous winter, the coroner was not able to determine an exact time of death, but it is estimated that the boy most likely died sometime after October of 1962. The boy's cause of death was unknown, but his death was considered a homicide given the circumstances under which his body was found. The toddler was between 2 foot 8 inches and 3 feet 2 inches tall, and he weighed between 19 to 30 pounds. He had sandy blonde or light brown hair and was wearing a red long sleeve shirt with horizontal thin white stripes, gray corduroy pants with an elastic waist and a buckle for size adjustment, ankle socks, and size 3 white shoes known as jumping jacks. The clothes were likely purchased at J.C. Penney and Norris Shoe Store in Medford. The police compared his footprints to more than 100 recorded footprints of infants born at the local hospital. Dental records at the time were rarely used, but this case changed that as the toddler had unique teeth which could help identify him easily. The police sent letters to neighboring counties describing the boy's characteristics. The police received several tips, but still were unable to identify him. The toddler was buried in a grave at Hillcrest Memorial Park in Medford, Oregon, with the gravestone that read, John Doe, name known only to God. The investigators did their best to identify the young boy, but the case would eventually grow cold. Then, in August of 2008, the boy's body was exhumed and a DNA sample was taken. His DNA was entered into the CODIS database in hopes of finding any relatives. However, no matches could be found. In 2010, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children created a composite sketch of the boy using the DNA extracted. In December of 2020, police submitted the boy's DNA to Parabon Nano Labs. The chief genetic genealogist, C.C. Moore, then used open-source DNA database GEDmatch to find two potential siblings. The police interviewed a maternal half-brother in Ohio, who told investigators that he had indeed had a younger sibling born with Down syndrome named Stevie Crawford, born in New Mexico. Stevie was born on October 2, 1960, making him just two years old when he passed away. He also told investigators that Stevie's mother took him on a trip with her, but that she had returned without Stevie and merely told the family that, quote, we won't be worrying about Stevie anymore. The half-brother said it was never discussed again. Stevie's mother and stepfather died a few years prior to the revelations, and his father's name is still unknown. It is unclear how Stevie died, but it is believed the boy's disability or lack of medical care could have been the reason for his death. Some close to the case wonder if the mother had something to do with the boy's potentially intentional death. Stevie was reburied in a family plot. The toddler was finally given the name he deserved 58 years later. Carla Walker was a 17-year-old teenager studying at Western Hills High School in Benbrook, Fort Worth. Carla was a popular student and had a boyfriend named Rodney McCoy, a quarterback for Western Hills Cougar football team. Family and friends said they both had a great relationship and never fought with one another. On February 16, 1974, Carla and Rodney went to a Valentine's Day dance at their school. 
The couple partied with friends at a Taco Bell and later stopped at the Ridgela Bowling Alley to use the restroom. The couple returned to the parking lot and began kissing in Rodney's car, pressed up against the passenger door. Rodney later told the police that an unknown man yanked the car door open and the pair partially fell out of the vehicle. The unknown man then repeatedly hit Rodney on the head until he fell unconscious. Rodney later remembered that he had been pistol whipped after the man had pointed a gun at his head and had pulled the trigger three times. Rodney told the police he heard three clicks, but nothing came out of the gun. Rodney said he remembered Carla then being taken away by the unknown man as she looked at him and told him, quote, Rodney, go get dad, go get my dad, before Rodney fell unconscious. When Rodney regained consciousness, Carla was nowhere to be seen. Rodney then drove to Carla's house with blood running down his face and notified her family. The family immediately called the police. The police searched around the parking lot and found Carla's purse and a magazine from a 22 caliber Ruger pistol. Two days later, on February 20th, 1974, Carla's body was found in a culvert near Lake Benbrook. An autopsy revealed she had been beaten, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death. Morphine was also found in her system. Police were able to recover DNA from the crime scene, but the technology at the time was not advanced enough to identify a killer. Soon, police were able to match the magazine found at the crime scene to a gun registered to Glenn Samuel McCurley. McCurley was a convicted car thief and lived just one mile from the bowling alley. Police learned that McCurley did not have work on the night of Carla's kidnapping and was off the following day. His wife was also out of town at the time. Police interviewed him, but he claimed that someone had stolen his gun a few weeks prior. He said he did not report it missing because he was an ex-convict and did not want to get in trouble. He denied any involvement in Carla's kidnapping and subsequent murder. Over the years, police interviewed several suspects, but none were charged. The case eventually grew cold. In 2019, detectives reopened the case, and DNA found at the crime scene was submitted to the CODIS database, but no matches could be found. Then, in July of 2020, Ortham Labs created a genetic profile of a suspect with the help of DNA found at the crime scene. The DNA profile was entered into GEDmatch, and in September of 2020, police were able to narrow down the search to three brothers, who had surnames as McCurley, as a possible match. One of the brothers was Glenn Samuel McCurley, who was interviewed in 1974 as a possible suspect. The police then took a DNA sample from his trash and it matched the DNA found at the crime scene. McCurley, now 78, was again questioned, but still he denied any involvement. He agreed to give a DNA sample. Soon, McCurley was arrested and charged with Carla's kidnapping and murder after his DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene. During his interrogation, he said that he had been out drinking on the night of the crime. He said he had parked his car at the parking lot and noticed a girl screaming in her boyfriend's car. He said he decided, quote, to help her out and was able to free the girl out of the car after a tussle with her boyfriend. He denied raping and strangling Carla. However, he later reportedly confessed to the crime after the investigators asked him, how did you kill her? And he answered with, I guess I choked her. During his trial in August of 2021, the video of his interrogation was presented to the jury and McCurley changed his plea to guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison and the case was solved after 47 years. On October 5, 2003, a pair of severed human legs were found in a garbage bin at an apartment complex at 1600 Hilton Head Court in Rancho San Diego. No other body parts were found at the scene. A coroner determined that the legs belonged to a woman who had been a victim of a homicide. However, the coroner could not determine the cause of death. Police could not find anything at the crime scene which could help identify the victim. 
They tried everything, but they were unable to identify her, so the case soon grew cold. In 2020, police decided to reopen the case. Her DNA was sent to the lab, and a DNA profile was created and uploaded to the genealogy databases available. Soon, her DNA matched a distant relative. The investigators then built a family tree to find a common ancestor between the victim and the relative. However, building the family tree proved challenging, as in this case, the family tree had to go back to the 1800s in order to find a match. Investigators contacted several family members to provide DNA samples to help confirm the victim's identity, and six months later, she was finally identified as Lori Diane Potter. During their investigation into Lori's life, police found that in 2003, Lori was 54 years old and living in Temecula and married to a Jack Dennis Potter. Investigators soon found substantial and they say conclusive evidence, which has not been shared with the media, that Lori's husband, Jack, murdered her. Lori was never reported missing to the police in the last 17 years, not even by her own husband. Her family and friends believed that Lori left her husband and her family thought she was living somewhere else. They never contacted police to inquire about her whereabouts. Authorities believe Lori was killed one to two days before her body was found. On May 12, 2021, Jack Potter was finally arrested and charged with Lori's murder. No details have been released regarding his motive. On May 20, 2021, he pleaded not guilty to a murder charge and is now awaiting trial. Born on the 4th of July, Maureen Brubaker Farley was always jokingly described as a, quote, firecracker. The eldest of seven, Maureen was often put in charge of her younger siblings and watched over them with pride and care. Sometimes her parents, knowing the amount of stress she was bound to endure when left alone with her six siblings, offered each one a bribe. Maureen's mother would give each younger child 10 cents apiece, a hefty sum in the 1960s in exchange for their promise to mind their manners for their eldest sibling. Maureen was born and raised in Sioux City, Iowa. Maureen moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, in order to be geographically closer to her new husband, David, who was serving time in the Anamosa State Penitentiary. With the cost of making a phone call to her family being sometimes fiscally imprudent, Maureen would take care to mail pictures of her life back home to her four brothers and two sisters who, along with their parents, eagerly awaited any news of the eldest child. Living on her own and working in Cedar Rapids, Maureen was impressing everyone with her ability to keep her life on track, despite impediments. Maureen was last seen alive at 5.30 p.m. on Friday, September 17, 1971. After she uncharacteristically neglected to show up for her shift at the diner she worked for, a local joint named Vida's Restaurant, located at 836 First Avenue Northeast, and later neglected to pick up her paycheck, her boss reported to her authorities as missing. On September 24, 1971, two teenage boys out hunting and exploring the area approached the trunk of what they believed to simply be an abandoned, dilapidated vehicle. Kevin Coppice, 15, and Danny Lineweaver, 14, first saw what they believed was a sleeping woman. They thought she was resting because of how she was positioned across the trunk, with one of her legs propped up and her back perched against the rear window. Not wanting to disturb the woman, they continued on their way, but on their walk back home, they decided to make a closer inspection, and that's when they realized the true horror. The two boys approached the car and realized the sleeping woman was actually the lifeless body of 17-year-old Maureen, who had been carelessly thrown atop the car's trunk. The grisly discovery was traumatic for all involved. Babies finding babies, the locals lamented. Three children, in essence, all exposed to trauma far beyond their years. Her body had been stealthily stowed in a wooded ravine located off of Ellie Road Southwest near the local dump in what is now Tate Cummins Park. The medical examiner ruled that Maureen's body had been there for, quote, no less than 48 hours and no more than 96 hours. She was partially undressed and was shoeless, but investigators noted that she had clean feet, which police said was evidence that Maureen's body had been moved post-mortem. 
Her cause of death was a basal skull fracture, a crack in the base of her skull caused by a brutal blunt force trauma to the head. Autopsy results also showed that she had been sexually assaulted. With Maureen's life cut short far too soon by an unknown and brutal killer still at large, many of the citizens in the community believed that the small town police squad was ill-equipped and improperly trained for such a large-scale murder investigation, resulting in the stalling of progress in Maureen's case. Her sister Lisa recalls that in the confusing and depressing aftermath of her sister's murder, that her family felt cut out of the investigatory process. Feeling helpless, Lisa and Maureen's mother sent a letter to Cedar Rapids Police nearly six months after her eldest daughter's body had been found, in which she detailed important information she believed police were ignoring. She wrote that she believed a man named George Smith was responsible for her daughter's death. Maureen's mother specified in her letter that George was not a friend of Maureen's but was known to her due to the proximity of his work to her home, as he was a cashier at a convenience store near Maureen's apartment. While police did interview George Smith during the course of their inquiry in 1971, they did not have enough hard evidence with which to charge him, or any other suspect for that matter, for her murder. In the ensuing decades, Maureen's case grew cold, and while the dead girl's mother insisted that she knew the truth, she could not produce any concrete evidence that would put George behind bars. Hoping that the case was going to be solved simply through allowing time for technology to catch up to the needs of the victim, police again tested the crime scene evidence in 2009, but to no avail. In the years that passed, Maureen's father would die with no answers to what happened to his eldest daughter. And hoping that that unfortunate fate would not also befall her mother too, in 2013, Maureen's family members created a Facebook page called Remembering Maureen Brubaker Farley, aimed at keeping the case alive in hopes that it would someday be solved. In those ensuing and lonely years, Lisa recalls of her grieving and aging mother, quote, Whenever anybody passed from this world, my mom said, Well, now they're up in heaven with Maureen, and they must be happy, and they must know the answers. But Lisa continued on by providing her own take on the matter, saying, quote, I just didn't want to wait that long. I didn't want us to wait until we go on to the next world. I wanted answers in this world. And on October 5th, 2021, Maureen's family finally got the news that they had been waiting for when police announced that Maureen's mother's hunch had been correct the entire time. Investigators had preserved and been able to recreate DNA profile from artifacts left at the crime scene. And after procuring DNA samples from the list of initial suspects, they were able to find a match. Lisa and Maureen's mother had waited for this confirmatory news for half a century. Five decades after Maureen's body was found, the Cedar Rapids Police Department cold case unit was able to conclusively link George M. Smith to the crime scene by utilizing DNA technology which was not in existence in the 1970s. Unfortunately, the case was closed without the ability to prosecute as George Smith, never charged nor arrested, was able to peacefully pass away at the ripe old age of 94 in 2013, a luxury not afforded to his teenaged victim, Maureen. The tragic taking of her sister from her and her family inspired Lisa to eventually join law enforcement in 1991, and she worked her way up to the position of sheriff. Lisa, upon finding out that her mother's suspicions were correct, says, quote, There was so much collateral damage, heartache from Maureen's death. Although her life was just one life, it affected so many for so long. In late September of 1941, light cruiser HMAS Sydney was operating on the west coast of Australia. She was tasked with escorting convoys from Fremantle to the Sunda Strait in Indonesia. On November 17, 1941, after escorting its most recent troop ship to its destination, Sydney made its return journey to Fremantle. Two days later, on November 19, 1941, at around 4 p.m., the crew of the Sydney spotted what they believed to be a merchant ship on the horizon. 
As very few merchant ships were allowed in the area at the time, the captain of the Sydney, Joseph Burnett, demanded via signal that the merchant ship identify herself. The merchant ship identified itself as a Dutch ship, Strat Malacca. However, Strat Malacca was not allowed to be in the area at that time. The Sydney then sent a signal ordering the ship to show her secret call sign. But despite repeated attempts, the merchant ship did not show the secret call sign. Thinking something was off, the captain of the Sydney decided to intercept. The merchant ship was not the Strat Malacca that it had claimed to be. It was actually a disguised and heavily armed German merchant raider ship called the Cormoran. The Cormoran had already sunk 10 ships in the Indian Ocean. As the Sydney drew closer to investigate the ship, the Cormoran opened fire. Although the Sydney was a far superior ship than the merchant ship, the surprise attack caused it to miss its first salvo while the Cormorans hit the Sydney. What followed was a 30-minute battle with both ships mortally damaging each other. The Sydney later sank and almost all of the 645 men on board died in that fight. The crew of the Cormoran, on the other hand, abandoned the ship. 318 of their crew members survived while only 81 died. The surviving German crew members were later captured by Australian vessels and became prisoners of war. A search for the sunk vessel found no sign of the ship except for a single empty life raft known as a Carly float and an inflated RAN life jacket. A few months later, on February 6, 1942, on the coast of Christmas Island, local authorities found a decomposing body on a Carly float. The broiler suit the man had been wearing was originally blue, but had been bleached white due to the sun. Not much is known about the autopsy results, as most of it was destroyed or lost during the Japanese occupation of Christmas Island. Despite a number of attempts, the body could not be identified, as it had no dog tags nor any items that could help identify him. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Christmas Island Cemetery. In the post-war years, after much speculation that the unidentified man's body had come from the HMAS Sydney, in 2006, the man's body was exhumed and his remains were examined and DNA samples were taken. The man was believed to be between 22 and 31 years old when he died, and between 5'6 and 6'2 in height. He had died possibly from a fragment of shrapnel being embedded in his skull. In the next few years, investigators put all resources available into identifying the man. Using dental records, they were able to narrow down the list to 50 members of the HMAS Sydney crew. His DNA would later be submitted to genealogy databases, and on November 19, 2021, exactly 80 years later, the man was identified as able seaman Thomas Wesley Clark. Thomas was born on January 28, 1920, in Brisbane, Queensland. His elder brothers served in the Army and in the Air Force. Thomas decided to join the Royal Australian Naval Reserve on August 23, 1940. After training at the HMAS St. Giles, he was promoted as Acting Able Seaman in July of 1941. He then went on a further training mission on HMAS Serbius before joining the HMAS Sydney. He was on board the HMAS Sydney for two and a half months before it sank. The HMAS Sydney's wreckage was found in 2008, but no other bodies on board were ever able to be recovered. On June 27, 1992, the dismembered remains of a woman was discovered in a dumpster behind the I Love New York Pizza Restaurant on Midland Avenue in Yonkers, New York, by a construction worker looking for a lost lottery ticket. Her remains were found in plastic bags within the dumpster. An autopsy revealed that she had died one day prior to her body being found. Both the victim's arms had been severed along with her right leg, and as a result, the police were unable to administer fingerprints in order to identify her. The victim had a hole in the back of her head from an axe or a similar weapon. Police were unable to determine if she had been sexually assaulted. The victim had a tattoo of a butterfly on her right shoulder and a scar on her left thigh. She was believed to be a heavy smoker and had cesarean scars, suggesting that she had had at least one child. It was believed that the woman was white or possibly Hispanic. 
Police believed that the woman was a prostitute and a transient, as she had not been reported missing. Despite a number of attempts, police were unable to identify the victim. It would take police a few years before they linked the case to one Robert Schulman. Robert Schulman was a serial killer who was active from 1991 to 1996. Schulman was a postal worker who picked up prostitutes in New York City and took them to his apartment in Hicksville, Long Island. He would then smoke crack cocaine with them before bludgeoning them to death. He would then dismember the women's bodies and dispose of their parts throughout Long Island, Manhattan, and Yonkers. Shulman was arrested on April 6, 1996, after a sex worker tipped the police off. Shulman confessed to murdering five women, including the Yonkers Jane Doe. Shulman said that after taking the woman back to his apartment, they both smoked crack cocaine. He says that he then blacked out and woke up to find the Jane Doe dead, after which he dismembered her and dumped her remains in a dumpster in Yonkers. Shulman was sentenced to death in 1999, however, he was resentenced to life in prison. His brother was also sentenced to two years in prison for helping him dispose of one of the bodies. The women that Shulman murdered included Lori Vasquez, Lisa Ann Warner, Kelly Sue Bunting, as well as two unidentified women, the Yonkers Jane Doe and the Medford Jane Doe. Shulman died in prison in 2006 of an undisclosed cause. Even though Shulman confessed to the murder, he did not remember the names of the victims, and the names of the two unidentified victims remained a mystery. In 2014, Detective John Geis of the Yonkers Cold Case Squad reopened the Yonkers Jane Doe case and asked forensic genealogist and artist Carl Koppelman to make a 3D render of the victim. In 2021, Detective Geis contacted the FBI and the DNA from the victim was entered into genealogy databases nationally. Just three weeks later, the FBI found a potential match to the victim's cousin. Detective Geis then flew to Michigan and met with the victim's possible sister and two brothers. They gave DNA samples and identified the victim from the photo and the butterfly tattoo. A DNA test later confirmed the victim was indeed their missing sister, Marissa Hammonds. On December 7, 2021, Carl Koppelman posted on his Facebook page stating that he had the family's permission to share details about Marissa. Quote, she was born in Kentucky in April of 1961 and was one of seven siblings. She spent much of her early years living in California. When she was older, she moved to Michigan and then to New Jersey, where she and her sister worked as fashion models. Marissa was a mother of two, but estranged from her family at the time of her death. Marissa was identified after 29 years. The Medford Jane Doe remains the only unidentified victim of Robert Shulman. She is described as being 5 foot to 5'1 and around 135 pounds, with brown eyes and reddish brown hair, which could have been dyed. She had a tattoo of a red heart with a white banner, which reads Adrian on her left shoulder. If you have any information about Medford Jane Doe, please contact the Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office at 631-853-5555.